Okay, good. So <coughs> we will carry on today to talk about abstract expressions. And we, we made a start last week looking at the artist Willem de Kooning, Dutch-born artist who arrived in America as an illegal immigrant. Actually, it's a, migration is a big story um, for the whole of the 20th and 21st century, people moving one, from one place to another and bringing knowledge bases that they acquired in one place into a new setting. That's often <coughs> a recipe for innovation, you know, cross-fertilization. And one could say that is true in de Kooning's case. Perhaps in some ways his art is has deeper roots in the European traditions than uh, many of the other abstract expressions. Not because none of the others were migrants. Rothko, for example, was born in Latvia, what was then part of the Russian Empire. Um, a lot of artists were new immigrants to America because America was an immigrant country, grew through immigration. Uh, but some new immigrants try to kind of really cut uh, off the roots of the past, try to kind of change themselves. Like Rothko, originally his name was Rothkowitz, you know, yet even his name gets changed, you know, gets shortened, simplified, abstracted, if you like, from compared to what it was before. But I feel with de Kooning you can see a sort of dialogue with, with Dutch art or European art. He's probably different from all the other abstract expressionists that we're going to concentrate on and that he doesn't really have this concern with the transcendental, with the spiritual. He's much more concerned with the, the world of, of things in which we inhabit. Okay, in a work like this, he pushes everything to abstraction. We were looking at this work, Excavation, last week. It's a large work, one of the largest of the works from that abstract phase, and um, color comes in, unlike a lot of the works of that time, which were uh, black and white, black and white enabling a, a simplification color comes in, but actually the, the color is just there in little notes. It's mostly monochrome. Um, it's abstracted, but like a lot of um, early cubist art of Picasso and Braque, which is similarly quite monochrome, actually, um, there's still the concern to reference the world. The world is the starting point. So we're still you know, abstraction hasn't taken us to a place transcending um, the world around us. There's still a kind of fleshy subject matter, I would say, here. I even pointed out, you know, like you say, teeth here. But I think also one gets a kind of imagery of, of bodies. There are certain kind of organic shapes that remind one of the, the human body. At the time, it was thought a, a big shock that he went back to the human figure you know uh, he's supposedly an abstract artist and uh, the trend seemed to be towards abstraction but suddenly in the early 1950s he's going back to the human figure in a very recognizable way but i suppose what i'm trying to say here is that it's not such a big difference you know i see the human body is still very much uh, in play as part of the the content of this work. Um, it's not really so far, but it certainly felt like that at the time, a kind of even sort of treated as a, a kind of betrayal by some artists that, he, that he'd gone back to figurative work. And a very traditional subject for art, the female body. And just place straight there, frontally facing out towards us, confronting us, you could say, right there in the center of the, the, the image. There's no work of composition to go on anymore, or well, at least the basic task uh, is, is already addressed. Just plonk it down right in the middle of things. Don't worry about where you're going to place the main forms in the painting. Of course, that said, still there's a lot of questions to be asked about how to 
compose the, the entire work. In fact, it took him over two years, from 1950 to 1952, to complete this work, which is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, so on the one hand, the subject matter is sort of easily recognizable, and it's given right from the start. Uh, there's no long journey to find what the subject matter is going to be, but there is a long journey in the making of the artwork to decide exactly how you're going to present it. So you could say that means there's a lot of emphasis on the formal side of art making, the process. You're very aware of the process over time. You, you're seeing the reworking. You know, he's not sort of hiding his traces. There's not a smooth, finished surface. You're very aware of the gestures the artist has made. The choices, the anxiety of choice. You know, this is a art influenced by existential thought, you could say, you know, that we ourselves have to make all our choices. Nothing is a given for us. We can't rely anymore on given religious uh, uh, metaphysical ideas or anything like that. Every instant, there's no rules about how to paint anymore. You could paint any way you want. So then that's a real responsibility for you. Uh, and with the Cooney, he seems to love that process, the anxiety of, of uh, thinking and rethinking. Oil painting is a good medium for this. You couldn't be doing this with the Chinese uh, Chinese ink, for instance, on an absorbent surface. You know, it just wouldn't work. But with oil paint, even more than acrylic, really, it, it uh, which becomes a medium later on. Uh, it's a medium where it takes a while to dry, and there's a possibility of scraping out and reworking, pushing the paint around on the surface, if you like. So that kind of hesitant reworking, which you f you can find all the way back to Cezanne. You know, he's also reworking, reworking in his works, thinking, composing in front of you. Composition is not sort of something decided in advance, which then you have to have to just paint it out onto the surface. You compose. It's a dialogue between your hand and your eye. You, you, you make a mark and see how it looks. You, if it doesn't look quite right, you move it around. In terms of the imagery, um, well, it recalls a lot of images in the history of art, but and I'll, I'll look at one or two in a moment. <coughs> but I think it's not just high art references, it's also popular art references, even sort of things like graffiti come into it, or sort of comic book uh, references. There's a sort of cartoonish exaggeration, say, of the, uh, of the figure. Um, I think also prehistoric art for, you know, primitive fertility symbols and things like that, the way the breasts are emphasized, the way they are often are in the, 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 those kind of works. But also mass reproduced images of all kinds. You know, this is the era of the, the screen goddess, you know, the, the beginning of the concern for um, mass media creating reputations, manipulating our emotions adverts, women's bodies used to sell all kinds of products. So I think it's a reference to that world. And that in a way makes uh, de Kooning quite a forward-looking artist to me. He's an artist who seems to look forward to the concerns of the, the, the pop artists, you know, next generation of artists who push art back from uh, abstraction towards a concern with the world of mass media images which actually surrounds us you know it's a modern phenomenon that to be surrounded by mass reproduced images that's not the way people lived their life in the 18th century every image was handmade at that time that, apart from a few prints or something but we we live surrounded in the post photographic era by all kinds of images so I think he, he's sort of dealing with this everyday world, world around him and yeah, 
it, it's an art that looks ahead to the same kind of concerns that pop art was worried about. Sometimes th the way he represents women has led him to be open to um, a certain kind of feminist attack of it. You know, this is, this is misogynism that he's sort of got a negative image of women. But in a way, the women in his images, you could say, are quite sort of powerful figures. They're not uh, passive uh, kind of objects to be looked at. They they have big eyes looking out at you. They are you know they have a certain kind of power to confront you, the spectator. And they they're certainly not coyly looking away while you you look at them. The power of the gaze isn't just you as the uh, presumed male spectator. Um, so I don't really accept that way of thinking about it myself. I'm, I mean, he himself, he said, um, women irritate me sometimes. I painted that. I painted that irritation in the women's series. That's all. You know, put it that way. It's not a portrait. It's a sort of archetypal image of some kind. Well, just to look at some possible <coughs> precedents, Rubens, portrait of his wife. Again, very sort of fleshy image, you know. And she has the gaze looking out at us. Well, it's, it's Flemish art rather than Dutch art, but it's still part of it kind of tradition that you could relate him to. <coughs> Soutine, early 20th century expressionist artist that we know de Kooning liked. Expressive distortion. Maybe there's more to do with emotion in Soutine than there is in de Kooning. Expressive distortions to create kind of a certain emotional mood, but still there are some similarities of handling, I would say. Or Dubuffet, French post-war artist. <laughs> he also very interested in images of, of, of women. He had an exhibition in 1951 at the Pierre Matisse Gallery in New York. Pierre Matisse was the son of the painter Matisse, had opened an important gallery in New York where a lot of you know, famous artists were shown. Du Buffet is one of the main figures of post-war French art, and his art is very inspired by child art, by graffiti. He formed an important collection of art of people suffering from mental illnesses of different kinds. Um, yeah, I think there's some influence there. Again, we know that that uh, de Kooning was aware of du Buffet. One of Jackson Pollock's neighbors told me that Jackson Pollock had a print of a Dubuffet painting on the wall of his toilet. <laughs> so you know, this gives another little bit of evidence that uh, these American artists were aware of what French artists would, were doing. Actually, Dubuffet even wrote a book about a very, very minor uh, American artist of this generation called Osorio. Actually, he's a Filipino artist who went to America. Um, Osorio, in his turn, wrote the introduction for the catalogue of Jackson Pollock's black and white painting show. <coughs> There's another one in this series of uh, the women series, Woman and Bicycle 1952 to 3. This one's in the Whitney Museum again, New York. So this time he it's pretty similar you know he's he, he doesn't have to worry too much about oh what's going to be the subject of my next painting you know he's just the subject is given so then it's all about the process you know you can be much more concerned with 
the how rather than once you've sorted out the what in advance. The only difference is a minor one that she's with a bicycle. He's given her some kind of prop to to work with. The bicycle is pretty hard to to make out, but yeah, okay, there's a handlebar, there's the wheel, yeah, okay, so it's so something to... <coughs> it's the area around <coughs> the w woman seems to give him the most interest or trouble, if you want to put it that way, how to unite her with her background. Um, you can see so much sort of reworking and how to knit the forms together. <coughs> so sometimes a line uh, will define something, but then the, fo the, the color and strokes beneath it won't obediently stay within that line. So that creates a sort of sense of ambiguity of space or overlapping and complexity of forms. Line operates separately from touch, you know, broader brush touches a lot of the time. In this case, there's a doubling of her grinning mouth. So she has a mouth and then another mouth like a sort of necklace. You know, at one point in one of these works, he cuts um, a mouth out of a, an advert for cigarettes and, and, and collages that to, to, to use that. Showing again that he's interested in this world of mass media. So something of du buffet's, um, it's, it's not got that kind of sense of uh, of a sort of you know sort of earth goddess figure or something like that, but still there's something of the the simplicity, almost childlike quality. It's sophisticated in another sense, but childlike in another sense. Working over a long period. Maybe she's wearing high heels, you know, it's uh, items of modern contemporary clothing. Finding the structure of your painting in the process of painting it. A journey, risk, honesty is important. Mm -hmm. Avoiding the e easy, obvious solutions. Accepting a certain kind of vulgarity, you know, he, he, de Kooning referred to the Western or, you know, post-Renaissance tradition as being vulgar and fleshy, you know, he's thinking of artists like Rubens, I think, and placing himself as part of that, that story. Here he is talking about the women series. He says the women had to do with the female painted uh, through all the ages, all those idols. Maybe I was struck to a certain extent, I stuck to a certain extent, I couldn't go on. It did one thing for me, it eliminated composition, arrangement, relationship, light. I put it in the centre of the canvas because there was no reason to put it a bit on the side. Marilyn Monroe. Well, this is probably the, the work that shows him engaging with contemporary mass imagery the most clearly. Marilyn Monroe is an icon picked up, of course, by Andy Warhol. So, yeah, this is a work which shows he's producing an art which is kind of relevant that, to the concerns that will be important <laughs> for artists even a, a decade or more later. Door to the River, 1960. Well, although the human figure, and particularly the female human figure, remains a concern for him in later works, there's also a, a phase here where he's concerned with landscape. So here's an example to that, Door to the River, 1960. He's sometimes using the really large brushes, like a house painter's brushes, rather than a, 
artist brushes to create these massive gestures. Landscape space, well, it, it, it gets rid of, it simplifies matters for him, uh, not having a human figure to deal with and all the kind of you know, details that that would require you to paint. Rosy Finger Dawn at Loose Point, 1963. He moved um, from New York City to uh, East Hampton. It's the same place that, uh, that Jackson Pollock lived. It became a bit of an artist community there. A number of artists went, went to live there. He actually moved there properly in 1964 after his new studio there had been finished um, and I think it's partly to do with moving to this new site that he's become more interested in landscape you know once you escape the city you can be responsive to that yeah um, the way that some of these titles are like not capitalized all the way through is that the artist's choice or is that just um, no, that's that's just how I, how I've done it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But you are you seeing some meaning there? Like, I just I wonder if you could draw meaning from that. Like, hmm. I don't know. <laughs> what what you what were you thinking? I don't know. Um, nothing in particular yet. Hmm. Just hmm. To clarify. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes. I mean, sometimes a, a title could be really important. Sometimes it could almost be like an afterthought that you need to, I need to distinguish them, you know, like you name ships or something. It doesn't tell you much about the ship if it's called, you know, HM, HMS Devonshire or something. It doesn't, it doesn't, doesn't mean it's like Devonshire or something. I haven't heard anything really said that much about his titles. People have sometimes said a lot about Pollock's titles because his titles are very evocative. But de Kooning's titles are usually fairly straightforward. Maybe that one, Rosy Fingered Dawn at Blues Point, that sounds quite poetic. Well, it's fitting to the work. The work is fairly poetic. Blues Point is a particular place not far from where his new studio was in. Uh, Long Island <clears throat> so it, it's kind of reference to his everyday surroundings and to the places he liked to go sometimes on a, a daily basis he would go out cycling to Loose Point he says I, I go to Loose Point a nice beach on Long Island Sound where the water is quiet not wild ocean I reflect upon it the water reflects but I'm reflecting on the water it's very splashy, you know, it's, it's a, a watery landscape he's painting and the way in which he's painting it has a kind of splashy, watery feel. Maybe the excavation painting which I showed at the beginning is a kind of earthy kind of digging into ground kind of association, but and now there's a lot of works where there's more watery associations. So he's saying, yeah, Long Island, the topography, uh, there's uh, ocean beaches, which are very, very kind of wild kind of water. But then there's the, the, the place like Loose Point, which is a more calm, uh, a, a kind of lagoon. So he's enjoying that topography and it's finding its way into his art. Rosy Finger Dawn, it's a very, um, it's, it's like a kind of, reference to to Homer, to the Odyssey and the Iliad, the language of that, you know, the wine dark sea, rosy fingered on, those kind of ways of talking, that's how I would read it. The Visit, nineteen sixty seven. Well the female figure stays with him in the nineteen sixties. And sometimes as here, it's the main subject. Other times, the task that he seems to interest himself in is how you balance between uh, the human figure and landscape, you know, trying to put the two together. 
Of course, that's again a big theme in European art, how to represent um, often a naked figure in a landscape setting. You could find that in uh, Rubens or, or Titian's work, for instance. The title here is hard to make sense of what is the what is visiting or who is visiting. Maybe it, the visiting is here because there's some strange object that looks like an eye, maybe an eye through a hand or something. Apparently at one point it was a tree he had here and then the tree goes, you know, because this is thinking over a long period of time, working, trying to not have too much idea in advance because that preconception could limit your vision, you know, even as a even a, a photographer could have the same kind of problem that uh, if you think you know what photo you want to take you might miss the more interesting one which is coming up. So the visit could be the thing that came here and then got painted over or scraped out. That's a, the best I could do about guessing the title in this case. The splayed lake pose of the figure again is very sort of vulgar or uh, un, you know, unelegant. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of uh, oh, the portrait. I should have actually had the, the comparison slide, but I didn't. Now I think of it, Monsieur Bertin, a male portrait by Ang, of a figure s sitting almost like a a frog about to leap or something, with hands on his legs. So all those, uh, I think, would be images in his memory bank. Yeah, this is more clearly a, a kind of sense of trying to deal with this task of how you unify the human figure and landscape within a single painting, 1967, two figures in a landscape. Sometimes in this work you'll see kind of news, in uh, works of this time you'll see newsprint that has uh, found its way into the painting because he's covered part of the canvas, uh, maybe deliberately hiding part of the painting from himself in order to work on other parts, a little trick an artist might play on themselves to encourage uh, themselves out of their patterns of thinking. Or maybe one part of the painting is getting a bit too worked, you want to cover it a little bit to prevent yourself going further with that. And then the newsprint finds its way into the surface perhaps at first accidentally, later deliberately. <coughs> <coughs> well, the human figure is almost impossible to read, but you know, you know, yes, the color tells you human flesh, but it's about unity with the landscape setting. That's the, the, the dominant thing dynamic rather than static compositional patterns. Whose name was written water, 1975. This is a title that's a, um, a quotation uh, from the writing of, of Keats. Um, Keats was the English romantic poet who he was buried in Rome and I think de Kooning had been to visit his tomb. Keats and Shelley had lived in Rome. And on Keats's tombstone it says, you know, here is a here is a man whose name was writ on water. You know, it means I'll, I'll not be famous or anything like that. I'll be forgotten. So water as a theme, we we're already talking about that, living near the water, trying to represent something of the experience of water. But here, even more so, perhaps, and it's coming to the title very, very much so. <coughs> he would use some funny kind of methods of working. So he mixed uh, his oil paint with a safflower oil as a medium. He would have some kind of solvent in there, and he'd put some water in there as well, make a kind of temporary emulsion of things that won't, don't normally work together chemically, an unstable, you know, 
conjuncture of materials and then use that. And then, of course, what will happen is the water will pretty rapidly evaporate. Um, you, you have bubbles left and shrinkage patterns or whatever. The paint will change after you've applied it. But he would be accepting those kind of accidental effects. So water is, if you like, the subject it here, but it's also um, you know, reflections on water surface or something like that. But it's also part of the means, even though he's using oil, you know, the, West, the, the dominant medium in the Western tradition, which is not a watery based medium, whereas in, of course, in the Chinese painting tradition, water is, is the, the central medium. Shan Shui, Shui Mo, water is everywhere in China. But um, here it's intruding into the world of oil painting at the level of medium. So wet looking images of water, process and subject. He had a quite a hard life in the sense of um, struggling somewhat with alcohol, you know, not unlike Jackson Pollock. Um, I stayed once with the artist who was actually like a next door neighbor of de Kooning. And he said when they invited de Kooning over for a meal, they always uh, cooked Chinese food because the, with Chinese food, you could just have Chinese tea to go with it, you know, and then you wouldn't have the problem of him wanting to drink too much, you know, as well as if you have a Italian food or something, oh, maybe we should open a bottle of wine and oh, one thing leads to, to another, <laughs> that sort of questions. But uh, at the very end of his life, he faced another problem, which is the loss of memory, Alzheimer's. I mean, now it's become a major issue as, as human beings live longer. We notice it's happening more often to people who haven't died of other things. So he's one person who had to face up to that. And he just kept on working and the people around him kept him working, gave him, you know, the, the made sure he had the materials to carry on painting, going to the studio every day. He was the kind of painter who would do that anyway. So um, steady in his working. And that leaves us with a funny kind of um, issue of what to do about those late works. You know, at what point can you say this is no longer the work of de Kooning, the artist, because he's, he's just not in a state of mind where he really knows what, what he's doing. He's not in command of his technique. There is no one point where, that, where there's a kind of uh, easy break between one kind of work and another different people have different opinions. So I'm showing you here some examples of those late works from a show at Gagosian Gallery in New York in 2013 of paintings by de Kooning from 1983 to 1985. Some things stay other things go like I think some of the the sensuality of the paint uh, the sensuous sensuous quality of the paint sensuality I could say too um, is lost here the colors become a bit diagrammatic to me but there's still some rhythmic sense compositional sense that has stayed something is held on longer than others there's that ambiguity between 2d and 3d Well, a difficult question to answer. Moving on to look at the work of Rothko. Now I'm starting to look at artists who were um, color field painters in their mature work, rather than more gestural artists like de Kooning and Pollock. Rothko, as I say, was born in Latvia or in the Russian Empire, 
1903, lived through to 1917. <coughs> His early work was anything but abstract and anything but colorist as well, I would like to say. And lots of images about, you know, struggling poor outsider figure in a modern urban setting, the hurdy-gurdy man. 1933, interior, 1936. Of course, it's always possible to read back on these early works certain and find in them certain traits which are there in the mature works. Of course, art historians, we love to do that. So, for example, this interior work of 1936, uh, it has a sort of frontality to it. Um, which is maybe a trait you'll see in his mature works. But I think for me, the m most important point to make is, you know, it's, it's really different from the mature works. There's a kind of quite a radical break or, uh, you know, important journey he has to make to get to that final work, um, signature style work from here. It's actually not particularly good, you know, I would say, these, these early works. They're not particularly outstanding in their own terms. But, you know, that's, if anything, is giving him an incentive to, to push forward, to find some place where he can express himself, a style that is appropriate for him, original to him. Not everyone would, would agree with what I'm saying, but I would say... You know, to me, it's not strong, and particularly it's not strong in its use of colour, which becomes the thing he's most well known for. So very interesting. How do you find your way through, you know? What possibilities await you if you can find your way through, but how to do so is the difficult part, maybe. Underground fantasy around 1914. Again, colour is not a particularly major factor in this work. You know, a black and white reproduction of it would serve almost as well to to describe it for you. It's a scene in the New York subway, perhaps. Reminds me of a work, although I'm, you know, it's a later work, so I'm not talking about influences uh, of George Tucker. His work, uh, The Subway of 1950, uh, so it's trying to describe that underground world as one of kind of urban anxiety and alienation. Maybe there's a touch of that there in Rothko too. Slow swirl at the edge of the sea, 1944. Clearly we're somewhere different now. We're not in Kansas anymore, you know. The, the big influence that's come in is that of surrealism, working from the unconscious rather than working from your... Um, everyday surroundings, objects around you. So it's, it's a radical break for him. For so many of these artists, surrealism is uh, a, a breakthrough influence. We saw that with Pollock. De Kooning stands out as, as, as different in that respect, that surrealism really isn't that important to him. Some of these works have an almost underwater feel to them. We're looking at the work that's based underground. Now, sometimes you have a kind of feel as if you're looking at, um, you know, strange creatures that live at the bottom of the sea or something like that. Or there's a uh, there's a slightly totemic um, presences. Like we can't call them human, but they they stand erect like humans. There's a kind of merging between animal and plant forms almost. Surrealism does that, for example, in the work of uh, Max Ernst. He himself says, Rothko, the, these pictures express for him a, a pantheism, 
in which man, bird, beast and tree, the known as well as the unknowable, merge into a single tragic idea. Some of the works of, <coughs> of this period are watercolours, that's you know, a medium that becomes important at this uh, time for him. The automatic methods of surrealism, working very fast, you know, that was, that's maybe influenced him a little bit. An interest in myth, again, it, like Pollock, it could be through looking at psychoanalysis and the ideas of uh, the writer Jung about uh, myths. He, he, he seems to want to make his own mythic material rather than illustrate a given myth. He says, if our titles recall the known myths of antiquity, we have used them again because they are the external symbols upon which we must fall back to express basic psychological ideas. They are the symbols of man's primitive fears and motivations, no matter in which land or what time, changing only in detail but never in substance. And modern psychology finds, the persisting, finds them persisting still in our dreams for all the changes in the outward conditions of life. Our presentation of these myths, however, must be in our own terms, which are at once more primitive and more modern than the myths themselves, more primitive because they seek the primeval and atavistic roots of the idea rather than their grace, graceful classical version, more modern than the myths themselves because we must now re-describe their implications through our own experience. So art is an exploration of the in a world you can see parallels between what he's doing and what Jackson Pollock did in the 1940s you know before either of them made their breakthrough to uh, an uh, their more purely abstract style vessels of magic 1946 again these sort of strange vertical presences uh, could again be underwater, like some creature from the depths. But the background space seems more important. You know, we, we're only one step away from his abstract style. If we could just get a, rid of these forms in the foreground and allow the, the background to be an actor in its own right. There's certain transitional works like this. He's really quite close now to his mature style, but there are more forms in the painting than are characteristically the case in those later works. It's um, sometimes referred to as multiform paintings. Many forms, but not really in a, a kind of tight compositional relation one to the other. The forms are, are quite amorphous. They don't have a strong dynamic quality to them. They tend to just sort of float there next to each other. And then before long moving to works like this where we do see, you know, his mature style. So number three, number 13, 1949, in the Museum of Modern Art. I just was showing you number nine of 1948. So it's the same time frame of uh, breakthrough to mature style as, as Pollock, the late 1940s. And once he's found this sort of format of his mature style, he pretty much stays with it. Just colored areas that have uh, a kind of feathered edge. They're not, they're not hard edge forms. And they, they're sort of st stacked, you could say, uh, in a vertical orientation. But they seem to float. They don't seem to have a sort of solidity t to themselves. They're vaguely geometric, but then they're never pure geometric forms. 
the interest is often around the edges. You know, you've got a kind of blurring or s sense of uh, that they're, they're very much handmade marks. They're not sort of nice, neatly, purely painted. So, for example, the red shows through uh, the green, but especially at the edge, you have a, a sense of the colors interacting interest is at the edge. Sometimes you have a sense of overlap that there are other layers beneath which are just about seeing through a sense of, of, of depth of you know working through cancellation to create the final work rather than just through addition. These veils seem to hide as much as reveal. It's little areas where you see paint seems to be randomly dripping. There is a sense of touch or the, the brush strokes are quite small. They're not on the scale of the painting themselves, which can be quite large, unlike in Jackson Pollock. Uh, they don't draw attention to themselves as brush gestures. You don't, it doesn't, he wants it to feel uh, a sense of a sense of aliveness or handmadeness, but not to, to have <coughs> each individual gesture be read as express an expressive mark. I think. And now, really, colours become the main me means by which everything is conveyed. There isn't this because the forms are so simple. There isn't this cubist interlocking of forms. There isn't a kind of architectural structure of forms. And of course, imagery has really disappeared. You could say there are sometimes associations, but you can never quite pin them down to clouds or you know sunsets and um, things in, things in the world in, in that sense. Nothing can be purely abstract. We'll always bring some associations to bear, but he's not trying to. Um, represent particular things and places. Rothko himself puts it like this, that it actually was a very difficult decision for him to abandon imagery. It's not sort of achieving abstraction was not something he felt was easy to do. Uh, a kind of logical conclusion that he had to arrive at. He says, it was with the utmost reluctance that I found the figure could not serve my purposes. But a time came when none of us could use the figure without mutilating it. Maybe the figure has too many associations. He says, the, the familiar identity of things has to be pulverized. You know, we've got to good destroy uh, the icons, if you like, the things that are too well known have too many associations maybe because they lead us to too much of a materialistic way of thinking it's a bit like religious iconoclasm the, the movements in religious history where uh, idols of gods images of gods are felt to be misleading and, and have been destroyed the feeling that symbols which were so important for his earlier 1940s work um, can't take you all the way that they can mislead or trivialize things. I think you could say he's taking a kind of religious view of art, that art has to deal with transcendental experiences. He uses that term. And the objects would get in the way of that. So you want a kind of a certain unboundedness in, in your painting. The finite associations, this is Rothko again speaking, the finite associations with which our society increasingly shrouds every aspect of the environment prevents the use of, you know, uh, is the problem, you know, prevents the use of uh, objects in the painting. Just because there are no human images, of course, it doesn't mean that there is no human content you know it's very much about the human world of Im emotions but 
you can't draw a line around an emotion the way you can uh, uh, a human figure. You've got to to somehow evoke it through more abstract means. Okay, let, let's take our break there. Have a short break.